Well, I didn't actually, I didn't tell him, I just said hi and nice to meet you. Oh, you didn't wave at him? And he gave me a nice not too fast.
Mozart make Mozart?
<laughs> March. Yeah, the March is good. Does anybody start? How about the uh, session? Okay. I come in on four. I can warn you. <laughs> Thank you. 
China? And we'll do both for two. Okay. Both for China? And it's murder, yes. Both for China. Oh. Yeah, 15 minutes. Okay, so it's coming again. Come over. Right here? Someone's going to come over and tell us when to stop. Okay, well, we'll hear this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, better. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay.
all your fifteen legs. Minuet? Yep. Did you
Will you all please rise? And will Regina Williams please come forward? Ms. Williams will lead us in singing the national anthem, after which we ask that you please remain standing for the invocation. say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the Thank you so much. All please be seated. Oh, whoa, whoa, stand, stand, stand. My fault, my fault. <laughs> you see, I'm already tired. <laughs> the invocation will be offered by Amina Darwish, the Muslim Life Coordinator at Columbia University. Before her role at Columbia, Ms. Darwish served as the Muslim chaplain of the University of Cincinnati and as a board member of the Islamic Association of Cincinnati. You know what, right? There we go. All right. I'm glad, congratulations, class of 2019, that following that performance is really hard, but I guess someone had to do it. I will recite a verse in the Quran, from the Quran and then I will translate it. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Inna Allah ya'muru bil 'adli wal ihsani wa ita'i dhil qurba wa yanha 'anil fahsha'i wal munkari wal baghy ya'idhukum la'allakum tadhakkarun. God commands justice, excellence, and giving to those closest to you. And God forbids what is shameful, blameworthy, and oppressive. God teaches you so that you may be purposeful. Whether you're a person of faith or no faith, morality is the common thread that holds us all together as human beings. You've handed in your last paper, you got finished your last final. Life's tests don't actually get graded the same way. Life tests are completely based on our integrity and who we are. And every test that comes at us in life just asks that question. Who are we? What is our integrity? What do we stand for? You have now received a powerful degree. And the, the work that you do affects everyone in society. Stand for justice. Stand for excellence. We can do it. God bless you, God bless your families and everyone that you love. Congratulations. Thank you.
Thank you, Ms. Darwish. Now you can be seated. I want to welcome the members of the class of 2019, 2019 and the alumni parents, alumni spouses, and other alumni relatives of the graduating students seated on stage. I don't want to forget the children because some of our graduates have children. Today, we extend a warm welcome to the family and the friends of our graduates and thank them for all the support and encouragement that helped make it possible for the graduates to reach this day. I ask our graduates, please, to give their family and friends a really warm round of applause. Another tradition we began recently is to invite alumni marking their 50th class reunion to join us on stage and take part in the commencement. With, with us today are two members of the class of 1969, David Berkowitz and Jeffrey D. Forcelli. Please indulge me for a moment to speak. I want to speak for a moment about Jeff, a member of the Board of Trustees since the year 2005. Jeff's grandfather came to America from Italy in the early 1900s with a little more than a shirt on his back and the willingness to work hard in his new country. He had no idea at the time that his perseverance would pay off and that he was starting something at Brooklyn Law School. He was really starting a dynasty. In 1931, his son, Liberato, graduated from Brooklyn Law School and embarked on a successful career as a general practitioner. Liberato, who changed his name to Don on the advice of his law school professors, was soon joined in practice by his brother, Vincent, who also graduated Brooklyn Law School, class of 1940. 29 years later, Don's son, Jeff, who's on stage tonight, this afternoon, followed in his footsteps, graduating from the law school in 1969. Jeff's cousin, Charles, who graduated from Brooklyn Law School in 1971, I think we're running this for just one family, was, was next. Jeff's daughter, Nicole, graduated in 2007, marking the third generation of the Forcelli family to graduate from the law school. Jeff started his own practice after graduating hanging his shingle in Oyster Bay, Long Island. He pract his practice evolved to focus on real estate and property development. In 1976, less than a decade out of law school, Jeff founded a law firm which is now known as Forcelli, Deegan, and Tirana, where he serves as managing partner. The firm is one of Long Island's largest and most distinguished law firms that represents a broad range of clients, both regionally and nationally. <clears throat> Jeff has been recognized by his peers with multiple honors and by several organizations for his selfless work and philanthropic effort, support. He also has made a point of giving back to the law school in significant ways. In 2003, as a tribute to his family's strong ties to the law school, he and his wife, Sadie, endowed a chair professorship at Brooklyn Law School. Professor Neil Cohen was named the first Jeff D. Forcelli Professor of Law. The following year, he endowed a second chair to honor his father, Don. Professor Lawrence Solon was named the Don Forcelli Professor of Law. Jeff and Sadie continue their tradition of generous support, and in their honor, in 2005, when File Hall opened, the law school named the Jeffrey D. Forcelli Conference Center, which is located, as you know, on, top, on the top floor of File Hall. Through the years, the center has been the venue of countless academic networking and social events for our community. Finally, 
Jeff DeForcelli Scholarship was established in his honor by an anonymous donor. The scholarship which recognizes Mr. Forcelli's extraordinary talents as a lawyer who not only has <clears throat> excellent skills, but also has practices with, practices with great integrity. It's awarded to a deserving student who has exemplified these traits during law school and shows promise to do so during his or her career. Jeff has said that his commitment to the law school is to continue its well-established tradition of excellence. He also feels very personal duty to the law school for its future. We are very ever so grateful for his many years of service to the law school and all he has done to help our students, our faculty, and for his monumental impact on shaping our bright future. Please give a round of applause to Jeff Forcelli, class of 1969. Uh, we have a little uh, surprise for you today. Uh, we have a special friend that has come to basically uh, wish you all the best and success in your lives. We are honored to have the senior senator from the state of New York, Charles Schumer, who really... <laughs> <laughs> I'll sit down. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Well, it's my great honor to address Chair. Thank you. <laughs> Chairman Sabotnik and Dean Fullerton, our great Solicitor General Underwood, the members of the faculty and administrators, and I want to thank all of them all the way down to the people who keep this place clean at night. You have made Brooklyn Law School one of the great institutions of higher learning in our state. So to all of the members of the staff, job well done. But most of all, to the class of 2019, congratulations. I'd like to say a brief word to the parents who are here. Well, I know how you feel. A few short years ago, my wife and I sat where you are, watched our daughter go on stage, get her diploma. It was one of the greatest days in our lives. You know, as parents, you've been through a lot. It's not easy to raise kids these days. But now, you get to watch all of your blood and sweat and tears pay off as your son or daughter walks onto this stage and into the next chapter of their lives. Congratulations to the moms and dads. On a personal note, I am blessed. My parents, 95 and 90, just celebrated their 70th anniversary. My brother, my brother, who's the a lawyer and the uh, smart guy in our family, figured out one in 10,000 people get to do that, so that's great. And a few more words of thanks. First, on a serious note, as we're here today, there are young men and women in our armed forces all over the world, overseas, many risking their lives for us. Let's have a round of applause for them. And finally, two personal notes of recognition. First, one of the police officers who's on my detail, Radu, uh, immigrants from Romania. His brother, Tim Ravika, is graduating today. Congratulations, Tim. And to someone very special to me, uh, Jenna Jones. Where are you, Jenna? You can't escape me, Jenna. Jenna Jones was my scheduler, not an easy job for seven years, only she and my wife could tell me where to go. <laughs> now, the amazing thing about Jenna's achievement is she worked full time for me while studying at Brooklyn Law. She juggled the demands of her classes. She coached moot court, all with the challenge of making sure that New York's senior senator gets to where he needs to be on time 24-7, 
365 days a year, no easy task. So to Jenna, we have some staffers who came in recognition of your achievement today, and the rest of the wonderful Jones family from Massapequa. <laughs> to Jenna, for you, I am sure the best is yet to come. So now that I've sufficiently embarrassed Jenna, <laughs> let me turn my attention to all of you. All of the late nights in the library, the early mornings in the classroom, have earned you a degree from a great institution. It's good you have it, because the world into which you're graduating is moving so very fast. We live in an era of profound economic and social change. In the old days, when you graduated from law school, the odds were pretty high. You might have the same job for 40 years. That's not so true anymore. Many of you will have several jobs, a good number, several careers. Along with these economic changes, the internet has put so much information at our fingertips that it's sometimes hard to figure out what's important and distinguish between what's true and what isn't. All too often, the loudest voices get the most attention. A generation ago, terrorist attacks, mass shootings, we never heard of these things. Now it feels like every week brings a new tragedy. So the world is changing in many ways, some good, some not so good. But the good news is this, your generation is better equipped than any other that came before it to adapt to these changes, to overcome the obstacles they present, to seize the opportunities they afford. Right now, though, sitting in your seats, many of you may not be sure of what comes next. With the world changing around you, sometimes it feels like you're jumping into a bit, an abyss. But the key, graduates, is not to fear the unknown. Embrace it, relish it, soak up every possibility it has to offer. Now, I remember having these feelings myself when I was much younger. I went to James Madison High School in Brooklyn, New York, which was then a working class high school. And then I was lucky enough to get into Harvard. In those days, no one from my background got into Harvard. It was all these folks from fancy New England private schools. I was the son of an exterminator who went to public school in Brooklyn long before Brooklyn was cool. <laughs> so I was scared. I went to one of the one fellow from my high school who had gone to Harvard before me. His name was Red O'Brien, and we had both played on the school's basketball team. When I asked Red how to make it at college, he told me, very matter-of-factly. He said, try out for the freshman team, basketball team. They're terrible, just like Madison's. <laughs> so you'll make the team easily, and those will be your friends. That's who you'll hang out with. Now, he did have a point. At Madison, our team's motto was, we may be small, but we're slow. <laughs> so now, first week of tryouts. The coach calls me up, we're wearing these little tiny numbers. Number 27, he says, yes, sir. You're Schumer, yes, sir. You played for Madison, yes, sir. How's coach so-and-so? He's fine, sir. Then he looked at me quizzically. He said, you played forward? I said, yes, sir. He said, how tall are you? I said, I'm six foot one, sir. He said, can you dribble? I said, that's not my strong suit, sir. He said, go home. He did not watch me touch a basketball. I was distraught. I wrote my mom a note. I told her it's only two weeks into school. I'm a flop already. I'm coming home. And I started, actually, to pack up my things. But as fate would have it, as I was packing, somebody knocked on my door. Who could it be? Was it my parents coming to take me home? Nope. Was it the basketball coach giving me a second chance? Nope. Or would it, was it the girl I'd been making eyes at in math class coming to ask me for help on our homework late at night? No, nope, no luck there either. I slowly turned the handle of the door and opened it. And standing there across the threshold was someone from the Harvard Young Democrats. They said, we're working for a man named Eugene McCarthy, who's for ending the war in Vietnam. Well, I didn't have a political bone in my body. My father was a Republican, my mother was a Democrat, but I had lost some friends in the Vietnam War, and I was worried about the future of my country. And so I said something that changed the course of my life forever. I shrugged my shoulders when he asked me to join the Young Democrats and go up to New Hampshire for McCarthy, 
I said, okay. The next morning, I got on a bus and went out with a group of kids from the whole Boston area. And we went up to New Hampshire. I had a great time. We divided up neighborhoods and knocked on doors. We designed our own leaflets. It was like sports, teamwork. And over the next few months, on the snowy streets of New Hampshire, working for an insurgent political campaign, I was bitten by the political bug. Now, maybe it was luck. Maybe it was God's hand. But in that moment of intense anxiety and uncertainty about the future, I took a leap and said, OK, to something completely different. And it enriched my life forever. Thanks to the McCarthy campaign, I realized how much I loved politics how deeply I cared about the impact it had on people. McCarthy, if you remember your history, didn't win the primary, but he came so close that the incumbent president, Lyndon Johnson, stepped down after just one term in office. A ragtag group of students and other nobodies changed the course of the world. I thought to myself, what a system, what a country. I was inspired. And I decided then and there I wanted to dedicate my life to making the world a better place. And just as many of you here in this audience will do, and thank God for you for that. Now, I changed my major from chemistry to politics, went to law school, ran for the state assembly here in Brooklyn at age of 23. And lo and behold, to everyone's surprise, including my mother's, I won. And the rest, as they say, is history. So graduates, on this day of your great achievement, my advice to you, take the risk. Follow your passion. For those of us who have gotten older and look back on life, one of the most painful things to think about is, what if? What if I had only done this? What if I had only gone there? In life, there will always be moments that present new opportunities and change the course of things forever. They usually won't be advertised as such. No one's going to label them for you when they appear. And sometimes they're as, they're as unassuming as a late night knock on the door. You just need to keep your eyes open to them. So my message to the class of 2019 is simple. Go for it. You're about to cast off into the unknown. It sometimes can be scary. But you've got great assets, a great education at Brooklyn Law and loving families who will always have your back through thick and thin. So garner up the courage, garner up the strength, put aside your doubts, take a chance. And if you do, it is my hope, it is my prayer, and indeed it is my confidence that you will find true success and joy in life. So to this great class of 2019, congratulations. Good luck. Godspeed, and don't forget, go for it. Thank you, Senator. I am now pleased to begin the program by calling Nastasia Shervovatsevich, who will be the, who is the valedictorian, and she will deliver the valedictorian the valedictory address. Good morning. My name is Nastasia Shrabatsevich, um, and I am so excited to be standing here before our esteemed guests and family members, our wonderful professors, and of course, the Brooklyn Law School graduating class of 2019. Having this, <laughs> having the opportunity to address you all on this monumental day is probably the greatest honor that I've experienced in my 24 years. And speaking of time, I would like to start by reflecting on a very important point in time. The moment when life on Earth 
first began. Now we learn in grade school that since time immemorial, inorganic compounds have been floating around aimlessly in our atmosphere. But at one moment, lightning struck and changed everything when it transformed those compounds into the building blocks of life. And from a world that was random and chaotic came order and meaning and the beautiful unraveling of a purposeful future. I believe that each one of us has such a pivotal moment in our lives, and I suspect that for many of us here, that one moment when lightning struck and changed everything was when we entered law school. For me, this moment wasn't just a revolutionary point in my life, but it also represented a radical shift in the history of my family. Before my parents and I immigrated to the United States, my family had always lived in Eastern Europe. I love hearing stories about my great-grandparents, most of whom I had never met. Whenever my parents or my grandmother tell me about these people, it's almost as if I'm listening to some dark fairy tale, a story about toiling farmers in the distant lands of Belarus before the advent of washing machines or cars or democracy even though these people were already living in the mid-20th century. Now, I don't know what many of these people look like because there are simply no photographs of them. And it saddens me to think that these people whose flesh and blood I am made of have not been memorialized in history. But it is also a marvel, I think, that I, as their descendant, stand here today amongst a group of educated, budding, young lawyers who have the tools that we need to advance the rule of law, and not only to be a part of recorded history, but to make history. For lightning has struck, and we now stand at the great frontiers of our future, and we hold incredible power. And just like every great superhero that gets their origin story played out on the big screens, today is the day to commemorate our beginning because law school has been, in so many ways, the final chapter in our origin stories. And as we go on, I want us to remember two important lessons from our time here as students. The first is about how we got here to commencement day. Graduating from law school requires extreme dedication and perseverance and rising after every time that you fall. I remember that at the end of my 1L year, I was feeling more mentally exhausted and uncertain of where my future was going than ever before. I recently read an interesting line from a letter of a young man, and I think this line best articulates how I felt at that moment in my life. When he was in the process of writing his first history book, this 22-year-old confessed to his sister, quote, I am afraid it is too big a task for me. I wonder if I won't find everything in life too big for my abilities. Well, time will tell. And time did tell, because the author of this quote went on to become the 26th president of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt, whose drive and achievements were so great that the only way to capture the sheer magnitude of this man would be to carve an image of his face into the side of a mountain. And just like young Theodore, how many times have we felt that the challenges that we were taking on were just too big for us? But standing here today, I see so many brilliant people who have weathered through the notoriously painful cold calling of 1L year, and who have gone on to write award-worthy notes and who have excelled in mood court competitions across the globe. I see students that will continue to represent this great school as the next generation of lawyers and judges and politicians. And I feel so incredibly proud and honored to have come from the ranks of you all. Our hard work over the last three years is exactly what has gotten us to the finish line today. And I have no doubt that it will continue to propel us forward into the future. But hard work alone is not a sufficient condition of success. 
In my experience, the other necessary condition is to work in the right place, specifically in a country that believes in giving opportunities and in rewarding hard work. In my country of origin, it didn't really matter how hard you worked because the opportunities were simply not there. I believe that it is a great tragedy when your ambitions outgrow the opportunities that a country can offer to its people. So I hope that we will all remember, putting aside our personal politics, that America is the greatest country on earth because it offers the greatest opportunities on earth and the freedom to take those opportunities. Thank you. And I think that we are all the living testament to that. And the second lesson that I want us to remember is that we have all went on this amazing journey over the last three years and that we did it all together. I have this distinct memory from the end of my first year of law school where our legal writing professor had asked us what we wish we would have known before we started law school. And I remember looking around the room of faces and thinking to myself then, as I think now, that the single most unexpected part of my law school experience had to be the quality of people. The students here have been so kind and eager to help and welcoming of one another that this place has taught me not only what it means to think like a lawyer, but also what it means to be part of an incredibly supportive community. My classmates, my friends, my comrades, thank you so much for this incredible journey. I hope that as we continue in our careers, that our bonds will only grow and strengthen over time. Thank you, and congratulations to the graduating class of 2019. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Ms. Sobatsevich. Now I ask Spencer Elliott Smith, who was elected who was elected by our students to speak on, the, on their behalf, please come forward to address the class. May it please the court, <laughs> members of our faculty, Solicitor General Underwood, and of course, our parents, family, and friends. Today's case is about the class of 2019. For our guests, let it be known I am not Brooklyn born or New York raised. I am a Missouri boy. Uh, back there, our mice and rats simply run through fields. They don't have the grit and the grind to take a piece of pizza and carry it up subway stairs. But rest assured, it didn't take long for me to discover the strengthening power of dollar pizza on a Saturday night, the one thing that can get you home when you don't think you have a shot. Like many of us, though, my journey to Brooklyn to law school, it was not steadfast and it was not clear. I made stops in New Mexico, Indiana, North Carolina, even England before I got to Brooklyn. Undergrad came and went, jobs came and went. To be honest, when I look back, all those places, I was just following a girl. <laughs> Thankfully, she had much more of life figured out than me. In our first semester, in my first semester of law school, some of you may know, I got married to that girl. <laughs> what a perfect time to get married, right? <laughs> so while we were all stressing about those cold calls in our first year, I was coming home only to get grilled again. In my dreams the night before class, the man in Paul's graph wasn't carrying fireworks. His boxes were filled with flowers and wedding programs. And yes, they still crashed and exploded, but somehow I was the proximate cause. I do have to take this moment to thank my wife. 
and all of my family that's here today, all my friends that supported us along the way, like so many of those closest to us, so many of our guests here today, she has gone through three years of law school as well with its own sets of ups and downs. I mean, think about it. I gave her the news that I got accepted. She was thinking her husband's gonna be a big shot lawyer. I think she was probably hoping I'd be a judge on hot bench one day, <laughs> that we would begin that swimmer money. <laughs> and then I dashed those dreams and told her I wanted to do public interest law. Now, she survived law school all the same, and I am incredibly proud to look out at her and all of our support systems that we have today. I will say a quote that's gotten me through these three years is, hanging on our door, it says, never laugh at your husband's choices because you are one of them. <laughs> In all seriousness, the places I've been, the places I dream to go, I can say today with the most confidence there's nowhere I'd rather be than in Brooklyn. Because right now in this moment, I am so blessed, thanks to you, to have this chance to look out at you all as one student body. I think back to some outside reading I did recently. I know it's been a long time since we ever even considered outside reading. But those absurdly giant law school tomes are packed away or sold off, and you can get back to your fantasy and fiction. You can find out in the books if Daenerys is actually going to, I won't spoil it for anyone that hasn't somehow seen last week's episode. So I came across this quote from a labor activist, Eugene Debs. This was more than a century ago and he said, while there is a lower class, I am in it. While there is a criminal element, I am of it. And while there is a soul in prison, I am not free. Now, I don't say this to spark a revolution in you, not today at least. Um, I say this because to me it's the anatomy, it's the essence of community. If you want to see strong, thriving communities, you can't ignore the ones that are right outside your door. You have to embrace them. I taught adult education classes here in Brooklyn for two years before law school, and I marveled at a community unlike any other. I saw brilliance, creativity, love, I saw survival and resilience. I came to Brooklyn Law School because this is Brooklyn's law school. Think about that, 2.6 million people, the largest borough, and on its own, it would be the fourth largest city in the United States, and we are the only law school here. We are a part of this community, and it is a part of us. Now, we're all going different places and starting different careers, but our bond as a class will always come back to Brooklyn. We may have spent our time in different ways, but this borough is a part of our growth regardless. The law school itself, 250 Jeralaman, it's just a structure. It's a skeleton of a building. What gave this experience life is the people. Many of us spent months living in our clinic offices, unearthing all of our mental and emotional energy just for our clients. Unanswered phone calls, after another, all for a DA that would never respond. Late nights, past midnight on an asylum case. A name change that would be the start to new beginnings for a young client. We put that love and care, not just for a JD, but because when we see our clients, we see our neighbors, our community. If you interned, if you came here to intern in the courts, you saw the intersection of true Brooklynites, program staff, court officers, advocates, judges, juries, all parties shuffling in and out and moving past one another. You may have lived in Long Island this entire time or commuted down from the boogie down, boogie down Bronx, but you hit up the same Brooklyn halal cart every week. You know every bartender and regular at O'Keefe's, at Floyd's, at Brazen. Some of you I got to come down to Flatbush for the best jerk chicken in the United States. <laughs> and every day you came through those doors, the staff in the library, the building maintenance, security, they supported our growth. 
This community has invested in us. This place is imprinted on us. And beyond that, this class is special. Everything I see in Brooklyn, I've seen in you. The creativity, the brilliance, the love, and certainly the survival and resilience. And like Eugene Debs quote, when, I, when you struggle, I struggle. When you reach new heights, I will rejoice. On a personal note, several of you have physically and literally lifted me and carried me up the stairs. You channeled your inner pizza rat for me. <laughs> Others listened to me as I rambled on in the cafeteria at 11 o'clock at night when I should be studying, and I needed that just as much. Yesterday, I submitted my admission to the second department. When I dropped those papers off, I felt the strength of 300 peers behind me. In the coming months, when you do the same, know that this class will be standing behind you. Thank you for everything you have brought to our community. Congratulations on this incredible achievement. And please, wherever you may go, keep this borough and this school with you. I'll go back to an ancient hymn from three of Brooklyn's wisest men. No sleep till Brooklyn. <laughs> Thank you, Elliot. That was terrific. It is now my great pleasure to introduce New York's Solicitor General, Barbara Underwood. She is, she is a true legal powerhouse whose career has been nothing less than extraordinary. I encourage you to read more about her in your program, as it will highlight just some of her background and professional career. She was born, not in Brooklyn, she was born in Evansville, Indiana, and grew up in New Jersey. She earned an AB magna cum laude from the Radcliffe College of Harvard University and received her JD degree from Georgetown University Law Center. After finishing in her class at Georgetown, Solicitor General Underwood was a law clerk to two of the nation's most brilliant legal minds. Chief Judge David L. Bazelon in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit and Justice Thurgood Marshall of the U.S. Supreme Court. Early in her career, she was tenured professor of law at Yale Law School, an adjunct professor at Brooklyn Law School, a visiting professor at New York University Law School, and a trial attorney in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. She then commenced an illustrious career as an appellate litigator and executive supervisor in a series of public offices. She was chief of appeals and counsel to the Brooklyn District Attorney, senior executive assistant for legal affairs to the Queens District Attorney and Chief Assistant and Counsel to the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of New York. From 1998 to 2001, she served as the Acting Solicitor General and Principal Deputy Solicitor General of the United States. She's the first female Solicitor General in American history. She has argued 20 cases in the United States Supreme Court. In 2007, she was appointed Solicit Solicitor General for the state of New York. With the exception of six month period from May to December of 2018, when she served as New York's 66th Attorney General, 
She has served as New York's Solicitor General through this time. Throughout her career, Solicitor General Underwood has worked tirelessly as a guardian of equal justice for all. Among the many high-profile cases she has handled, she has fought against racial discriminatory jury selection, argued that federal law protects employees and students of federally funded educational institutions from sex discrimination, and defended the constitutionality of reasonable buffer zones around women's health clinics to protect women's rights to choose. Brooklyn Law School is honored to welcome Barbara Underwood today and to award her its highest degree. Will Solicitor General Underwood and Dean Fullerton please join me at the podium. Solicitor General Barbara Underwood, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the, or by the Board of Trustees of Brooklyn Law School, I admit you to the degree of Juris Doctor Honoris Causa and cause the appropriate hood to be placed on your shoulders and a token thereof, I present you with this diploma. We'll now hear, of course, from Solicitor General Barbara Underwood. Thank you for that lovely introduction, and thank you, Dean Fullerton, the Board of Trustees, faculty, students, and friends for this honorary degree, for welcoming me into the Brooklyn Law School family, and for inviting me to address the wonderful class of 2019. I suppose one of the reasons I was asked to speak with you today is that I was the first woman Attorney General of New York and the first woman to serve as Solicitor General of the United States as well. When people talk about these first woman achievements, I think of a New Yorker cartoon I had on my refrigerator about 45 years ago in which one little girl says to another, I'm afraid by the time I grow up, it will be too late to be the first woman anything. Those little girls are grown up now, and some of their daughters are too, and remarkably, it's still not too late to be the first woman anything. At least we've made some progress. In 1869, Arabella Babb Mansfield was the first woman to be admitted to any American state bar. That was in Iowa, where the state Supreme Court struck down the law that made women ineligible to practice law. Three years later, Myra Bradwell tried and failed to persuade the US Supreme Court to strike down the Illinois ban on the practice of law by women. And then in 1873, the Illinois legislature eliminated the restriction, passing a law that prohibited the exclusion of women from any profession. And in 1886, New York's Kate Stoneman, after failing to persuade a court to strike down New York's restriction, got the state legislature to eliminate it. All over the country, courts and legislatures were gradually eliminating the formal legal barrier that prevented women from practicing law. It would take longer to overcome informal cultural barriers and employment practices. By 1890, there were 208 women lawyers in the United States, according to the census, out of some 89,000 lawyers altogether. And now there are so many women lawyers that it's hard for many people to believe how widespread the notion once was that women are un unsuited to the practice of law. It's worth taking a moment to remember the concurring opinion of Justice Bradley in Myra Bradwell's case. He wrote, that the natural and proper timidity and delicacy which belongs to the female sex evidently unfits it 
for many of the occupations of civil life, including the practice of law. That was in 1872. You may suppose that such thoughts are unthinkable today, and maybe they are, but I can report that about 100 years later, someone said something very similar to me. I was clerking for Chief Judge David Bazelon on the DC Circuit. I applied to be a law clerk with Justice Thurgood Marshall. There had been only three women law clerks at the court before then, but it didn't occur to me that I was up against any special obstacle as a woman. I was in for a surprise. Like some of his colleagues, Justice Marshall had a group of former law clerks screening applicants for him around the country, and I was invited to an interview with a lawyer who was playing that role for him in DC. I went to the interview and I listened for a half an hour while the lawyer talked. At the end of that time, the lawyer asked me if there was anything else I wanted to know. I said, no, but maybe you would like to know something about me. He took a deep breath and said, well, yes, there is. He said, don't get the wrong idea about this. My partners told me not to ask this question. And at this point, I braced for some question about my marriage or my plans for starting a family. And then came the question, how do you feel about dirty jokes? I said, I laugh when they're funny and not when they aren't. <laughs> this is serious, said the lawyer. The justice likes to tell off-color jokes, and it's important for him to feel comfortable telling jokes to his clerks. Also, he likes his clerks to add to his repertoire. And this is not a sexist question, he said. I wouldn't send a prissy man to the justice either. Well, I said, you can ask Judge Bazelon about that. He seems to feel free to tell off-color jokes in my presence. And I walked out thinking that was the end of that clerkship. A week or so later, the justice's secretary called to invite me for an interview with the justice. My fellow law clerks at the Court of Appeals, on hearing about this, began to tell me one dirty joke after another for possible use during the interview. <laughs> I memorized a few, but I, I couldn't really imagine using them. When I walked into his chambers for the interview, the justice walked over to me and said, I hear there's been some nonsense about my not wanting a woman around here. Well, that's a lot of bullshit. He proceeded to ask me what I thought of a recent opinion. We had a great discussion, and he offered me the job. So we had made some progress in 100 years. Justice Marshall didn't think women were disqualified for working, from working with him, even though a member of his screening committee did. Here's another story about what it was like to be a pioneer woman from just a year later. I arrived at Yale Law School as a new assistant professor in August of 1972, the second woman ever on the faculty. There weren't many people around the law school building in August. I had a small office in what was once a dormitory room. I looked around for a nearby ladies' room, and all I found was a door marked faculty. I asked the other newcomer just down the hall what was behind that door, and he said, it's a restroom. He'd been told it was a men's room, but there were no urinals, just stalls. And he said, I don't see why you can't use it too. I thought that made sense, but I didn't really know who else might be using that restroom or might be upset, so I put up a sign. This is to advise you that starting one week from today, I intend to use this faculty restroom unless I hear a substantial objection. Pretty soon after the sign went up, there was a dean's cocktail party for fa faculty returning from summer vacation. And after the party, the younger faculty, all men, invited me to join them at a local restaurant. I arrived and was bombarded with questions about the sign. How long have you been obsessed with bathrooms? <laughs> Why was your first move on arriving at Yale to start a bathroom revolution? And why, if you wanted to use the faculty men's room, did you choose such a hostile way of saying so? Why did you put up a sign instead of going door to door to ask people's permission? I said, I just wanted to use a restroom near my office, and this room seemed like the most likely candidate, and I made a mental note to look elsewhere for friends at Yale. 
The next day I had a visit from the person I will always think of as Dean of Bathrooms. <laughs> he said, you know, there's an unused restroom just down the hall from you on this dormitory corridor. How about if we clean it up and install a mirror and label it a ladies room, would that work? Yes, I said that would be fine, and so it happened. Nobody said a word about the incident to me for quite some time. And then one day, Ruth Ginsburg, then a Columbia Law School professor, came to talk at Yale, and afterward I drove her to the train station. And on the way she said, I was at a meeting of the restatement of judgments recently, and I heard a strange story about you. Someone said the new young woman professor at Yale has started a campaign to let women into the men's rooms. <laughs> Is that true? So I told her what happened. We had a good chuckle. I dropped her off at the train station and I thought, well, my academic career is about to end before it begins because I will forever more be known only for trying to integrate the bathrooms. I retired that story for many years while I set about building my reputation in more traditional ways. I brought the story out of retirement lately because as I believe Ruth Ginsburg says in one of the RBG movies that came out this year, it turns out that every pioneering woman has a bathroom story. And I bet there are people in this room who have bathroom stories. And now I'd like to say something about why all these pioneers, all these firsts are important. Why it matters to have women in positions of leadership, in the law, and in the rest of society as well. It's not that there's a single woman's point of view that will change outcomes. Instead, it's that women, like other outsiders, have some important life experiences in common, and those experiences can make a difference in decision making. The Supreme Court writing about discrimina sex discrimination in jury selection in 1946 said, a flavor, a distinct quality is lost if either sex is excluded from the jury. Thurgood Marshall writing about race discrimination in jury selection in 1972 said something similar. He said, when any large and, un and identifiable segment of the community is excluded from jury service, the effect is to remove from the jury room a perspective on human events that may have unsuspected importance in any case that may be presented. Justice Marshall was explaining why the exclusion of blacks from juries was harmful not only to black defendants, but to all defendants, and indeed to everyone. It was the distinctive experience and the distinctive perspective that mattered, not some predictable, distinctive vote. Justice Marshall knew, we all know, that women or African Americans do not always vote together, and certainly they don't always favor the litigant who looks like them. But women and other groups too bring to decision making a distinctive life experience, and then they each use it differently. Part of that shared experience is specifically female, and part of it is the experience of being different, of being the only woman in a room of men, like being the only African American in a room of white people, and of struggling to be taken seriously. Justice Marshall understood the connection between race discrimination and sex discrimination and other forms of discrimination too, and he had no patience for any of them. He was one of the first justices to hire a woman law clerk, and he insisted on writing his anti-discrimination opinions in a way that condemned not only race discrimination, but sex discrimination as well. In fact, he said it was racist to think that blacks were the only people who needed the protection of the anti-discrimination laws. So it seems fitting that it was the first woman Supreme Court justice who made the point about perspectives rather than outcomes in her tribute to the first African American justice. After he left the court, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor wrote that she would miss Justice Thurgood Marshall at conferences because he brought a perspective shaped by his life experiences and he was constantly pushing and prodding the others to see what he saw. He not only changed the conferences he attended, but even the conferences that took place after he was gone. Justice O'Connor wrote that even now, 
I still catch myself looking expectantly for his raised brow and his twinkling eye, hoping to hear just once more another story that would by and by perhaps change the way I see the world. That's one of the most important challenges of our times, to bring into the courts and the law firms, the boardrooms and executive suites, in business and in government, in the academy and in all the institutions of our society, many different perspectives so that we can have the tools to build the bridges that are needed to unite rather than divide our large and diverse state and our even larger and more diverse nation. So my parting advice to you, members of the class of 2019, is this. When you go out into the world and into the legal profession, try to make it a better place, try to make your distinctive voice heard, and to listen to as many unfamiliar voices as you can. And also, don't be afraid of being a pioneer. It turns out to be a pretty rewarding thing to do. Thank you, Solicitor General Underwood. Dean Mary Ellen Fullerton will now address the graduating class. Good afternoon. Congratulations to all members of the Brooklyn Law School class of 2019. I am especially delighted to be here because, like you, I am graduating too. <laughs> Brooklyn Law School will soon have its new dean when our esteemed colleague, Michael Cahill, returns to take the helm and I return to the full-time faculty. I feel a special connection with the class of 2019 and I hope you welcome me, not just as a former dean, but as a member of your class, because trust me, I am as relieved as you are to be graduating. <laughs> Before I address the graduates sitting in front of me, who I gotta tell you I can't see because the lights are blinding me, um, I wanna give everyone in this theater and those watching throughout the world a glimpse of how extraordinary our graduates are how dedicated they've been, how much they love Brooklyn Law School. Let's hear what they have to say. The thing I'll miss most about Brooklyn Law is my friends and the community itself. There's a general vibe that everyone wants to do well, everyone wants to see each other succeed. You hear a lot about other law schools being competitive and, and cutthroat, and I feel like here everyone lifts each other up. Brooklyn is amazing. I thought it was just a culture shock of, you know, how cool it is and how many different diverse areas there are. What I'll miss the most is about every 30 minutes when I would roll through the hallways and look for someone to, to just chat up and talk with. From day one, I felt that the faculty was actually interested in my success. We have some of the most intelligent and respected professors in the industry. I just love being able to study in an environment that's energetic and has a lot to offer, so I'm really gonna miss that. The most memorable experience that I've had here at Brooklyn Law has been being on the Brooklyn Law Review. I was fortunate enough to be selected for publication and be selected to be an executive board member for my third year. I ran for treasurer of International Law Society. It was interesting to kind of work, create the budget over the summer, and then to be so involved with all the events that we threw. The prosecution clinic at the Brooklyn DA's office. You get your own caseload, you're the one talking to witnesses, talking to defense attorneys, appearing in court. Definitely the health law clinic. I've been in outlaws the past three years, so that's been one of my favorite parts of Brooklyn Law School, being able to work with other LGBTQ students here and allies. This year, I was lucky enough to be the president of the Moot Court Honor Society. It's 133 members, and working with everybody, setting up different pairings, getting to know everyone individually, developing the skills they're gonna need in the real world. I am president of MALSA, the Muslim Law Students Association here at Brooklyn Law, and we recently had to hold a vigil for the shooting in New Zealand and in three days we were able to host a very very successful
beautiful event with support from all the different student organizations, from all the different professors, and it really showcased how much Brooklyn Law School supports its students. The Black Law Students Annual Alumni Dinner, where they had alumni, recent grads from Brooklyn Law School come back and they would give them awards and they would also speak to us about their experience. Seeing them and meeting them kind of gave me like the eyes that there was a finish line after the race. I like to say thank you to my parents for always supporting me throughout the years. Quiero agradecer a mi mamá porque todo esto fue posible por ti. I'd want to say thank you to my grandma because uh, she made all of these dreams possible and she has worked so much overtime. I have to say thank you to the friends that I made on the first night of law school that we literally all moved in and the countless nights at the Brazen Head that we've spent together. <laughs> I just want to say thank you to the administrative people here and the staff. I guess all the women attorneys in this field that I've spoken to who are always a good sounding board for me in any questions that I had. It's my privilege to serve as a second lieutenant in the United States Marine Corps, and after law school, I'm going to be a staff judge advocate, commonly known as a JAG officer. I will be working in the Labor and Employment Division at the City Law Department, and then I will be clerking for Judge Reyes in the Eastern District of New York. I'll be working at Brooklyn Legal Services in their housing unit. I will be at the Bronx District Attorney's Office. I will be working at Marin's Weiss & Newman. It is a condo, co-op, and real estate law firm. I'll be joining a corporate firm, uh, Blank Rome, in the fall. Allen & Overy, they're one of the largest firms in the world. I'll be working at the law offices of Neil Rosenberg, a special education firm in Manhattan. Quinn McCabe. I currently work there throughout the year, and now I will be an associate starting in the fall. Through the career services at Brooklyn Law School, I obtained a job at a big law firm in Manhattan. I'll be working at Winston & Strong to practice employee benefits and executive compensation. I will be staying at the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office as an assistant district attorney next year. I'll be working for Schaub, Amity, Citroen, and Spratt in the appellate practice group. I will be at Abrams Fensterman working in commercial litigation. This September I'll be starting at Legal Aid Society uh, in their criminal defense practice. I was a summer associate at Brian Cave last summer and got an offer to work there after I graduate, which is really exciting. Class of 2019 has put in a lot of hard work, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, and uh, it's nice to see that our hard work is finally going to pay off. I took advantage of all the experiences that I could, and I had a blast doing it. Keep connected. I know that I was assisted greatly by alumni throughout law school, and I think now it's our time to become part of the Strong Alumni Network. I hope that we always remember why we became lawyers. Regardless of how it works out or how you want it to work out, you can and you will achieve everything that you set out to do. Congratulations. Don't take this experience for granted. Use it for good. You have this whole new power to you, and now it's your job to go out there and change the world, because you can. It is in good hands with the students of the class of 2019. Now, today, the commencement speaker and honorary degree recipient, Solicitor General Barbara Underwood, has been a role model for me and someone whose career I have followed closely for many years now. She continues to be a trailblazer and an exemplary public servant. I want to say to all of you that it's impossible to measure the positive difference Solicitor General Underwood has made for New York and for the nation. And it's a special honor to have her as part of the class of 2019. Thank you. As a woman and as a dean, I'm thrilled to share the stage with not only Solicitor General Underwood, who, by the way, has now argued 21 cases in front of the Supreme Court. Uh, Three weeks ago, you may have read in the news that she argued the census case on behalf of New York State at the Supreme Court, and we're all uh, waiting with bated breath for the results. Uh, in addition to Solicitor General Underwood, Chaplain Amina Darwish, thank you for calling us together this morning and for offering the invocation to launch this class. Nastasia Sherbatsevich, you are a living embodiment of how immigrants enrich United States society as we witness your brilliance. And the work effort you devised 
you sent, spent on your career as a law student. Next in line, Vice Dean Christina Mulligan, thank you for the enormous assistance you've been to me and to Brooklyn Law School this semester. I look forward to your first foray into reading the names of graduates as they come to the stage. <laughs> Believe me, this is tough. And thank you to all the faculty members, women and men, sitting on stage. They've been my colleagues, they've made me a better law professor, a better dean, and a better human being. Thank you. And now you, the class of 2019. I'm thrilled to be here with you. It's exciting to see your launch into the legal profession today. I know, as earlier speakers have encouraged you, I know you will use the power of your law degree to lead the way forward to a more just society. A society in which people will not be held in jail because they lack the money to pay bail in which incarceration will not be the default penalty for those convicted of crimes, in which cities around the country will provide lawyers for poor tenants facing eviction, in which immigrants facing deportation from the country where they have lived for years will have legal representation, not just in theory, but in reality. a society in which access to the legal system will be universal. Access to the legal system has been an integral part of the Brooklyn Law School story from the very beginning. 118 years ago when we opened, we welcomed women as well as students of colors, sorry, color, immigrants, and others whose family backgrounds did not allow them through the doors of most law schools. A woman, Edith Adelaide Miller attended the law school in its very first year in 1901. By 1917, there were 53 women out of 279 students at Brooklyn Law School. In 1918, the number of women rose to 70. Today, women make up 53% of the class of 2019. <laughs> I'm proud of that, and I'm proud to say that Brooklyn Law School has played an important role in allowing women access to the law. But I'm also realistic. Despite progress, women and other groups that have been traditionally underrepresented in the legal profession have faced and continue to face many barriers. From the movies, you're all familiar with the cold shoulder that Ruth Bader Ginsburg received when she graduated from law school here in New York. Consider also the example of Sylvia Zucker Bernstein, a member of the Brooklyn Law School class of 1949. 70, seven zero. Years ago today, Sylvia Bernstein graduated from Brooklyn Law School. After graduation, she took jobs around Court Street working for solo attorneys. She then enrolled in secretarial school to learn stenography in order to get a job in a law firm where when she joined up, she could do minor matters, but she never had the opportunity to advise a client or negotiate a real estate sale or argue a motion. By 1956, her law career had ended and she took up teaching civics and social studies in junior high school. You won't be surprised to learn that in my view, teaching is a noble profession. Having once tried to teach one of my son's seventh grade classes, I know those who teach junior high are truly saints. <laughs> so I value the work that Sylvia Bernstein did, but I lament that she did not get to follow her preferred career. She went to law school, she graduated, she persevered, but ultimately the barriers were too high. There is a happy sequel. Sylvia's daughter is our very own Professor Anita Bernstein. Professor Bernstein is the nationally recognized scholar on tort law and feminist jurisprudence that her mother did not have the chance to be. Although Sylvia Bernstein cannot be on stage with us today due to limits on her mobility, I would like to recognize her fortitude. Will you join me in giving a round of applause to her for all she has accomplished? We 
have come so far from 1901 to 1949 to 2019, and yet how far we have to go. Just last fall, the American Bar Association's Commission on Women in the Profession and the Minority Corporate Council Association reported distressing news about the daily lives of women lawyers. Frequently, they are mistaken for custodial staff, interrupted by male colleagues and judges, criticized for being too assertive, penalized for parenting, and yes, this is still true, paid less than male counterparts. You, the class of 2019, are entering a world where professional barriers persist. I urge you all, as you start your career, to resist and overcome these barriers. The gender pay gap is real. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, full-time lawyers who are women earn 77% of what men in the same positions do, even with similar qualifications and experience. The litigation practice gap is real. Although law schools have enrolled equal numbers of men and women for the past 20 years, female attorneys account for just 25% of the attorneys appearing in commercial and criminal cases in New York courtrooms. The more complex the litigation, the less likely a woman to appear as lead counsel. The glass ceiling in big law has yet to be cracked, much less shattered. Women represent only 19% of equity partners at major law firms. The picture is even worse for women of color who experience the double whammy of sex and race discrimination. They are underrepresented throughout the legal profession and almost invisible at the top levels. The problem of sexual harassment is real. Women lawyers have not escaped this pervasive scourge. Deep structural issues relegate women and people of color to lower status in the legal field. This is the challenge for the class of 2019. I want to particularly draw your attention today to workplace structures that fail to accommodate a balanced life. They are a great barrier to women's advancement. And these structures keep all of you from playing fuller roles in your families, with your friends, in your community. A recent New York Times article profiled a married couple who, who graduated from the same law school, got the same types of jobs, with the same handsome salaries. 10 years later, the husband works 60 to 80 hour weeks for a big firm, while the wife works 21 hours a week for the city, a job that enables her to do most of the parenting and manage the home. The reality of grueling work schedules for many professionals these days leads to too many women making career compromises so that their families can thrive. This is true not just for big law. This affects public interest lawyers too. Women are the canary in the coal mine. They want careers with more predictable hours and with flexibility on the timing and location of work. They want more time for human connections outside of work, more opportunity for involvement in the community. Men want that too. We should not be campaigning to get more women into 60-hour work weeks. We should be striving to change the workplace that so nobody is expected to do that. <laughs> Two evenings ago, I sent my children an early draft of today's remarks. My son, a young lawyer, sent me his comments at 1 a.m. from the office. He noted that it would be difficult for many moms to still be at the office at that hour, and he wished he didn't have to be there either. A system more compatible with women's needs would be better for the vast majority of lawyers. That's what we want to accomplish. By the way, my daughter sent her comments during daylight hours, but she was on vacation. <laughs> so how can you, class of 2019, challenge these structures? Just as lawyers need to be aware of the structural barriers that harm their clients, you need to be conscious of the barriers your colleagues with children or elderly parents or other obligations face. You need to speak up for your coworkers as well as for yourselves. Law firms and businesses benefit from lawyers who are always available. Nonprofit organizations do too. 
They are currently losing great talent because so many women refuse to take those jobs. The firms and organizations have been content with a lopsided employment pool. They will change only when they risk being seen as thoroughly undesirable places to work because men, as well as women, reject the overworked system. I hope you, class of 2019, will stand up and demand change. I hope you will challenge the notion that lawyers need to be available at all times. I hope you will take serious the importance of work-life balance in your career choices. Your decisions will have far-reaching consequences. They will benefit women as well as men, children, families, and a more robust society. Positive change is beginning to happen, but you must be persistent and vigilant. If you are, I am confident that you, class of 2019, will be the instruments of change. It has been a privilege to serve as the interim dean this year. Getting to know you and working closely with our faculty, alumni, and staff has given me an even greater appreciation of the strength of our law school, and it's given me faith that you will have a lasting impact on our city, our country, and our world. And by the way, it's reminded me what it feels like to wonder if I'm going to make it through to the end. <laughs> Lighthearted remarks aside, I'm proud of all of you. I'm grateful to have been selected to be your interim dean this year. I'm confident the law school will be in good hands when our new dean takes office in July. Thank you for joining me throughout this extraordinary year, and congratulations, class of 2019. I want to thank um, Dean Mary Ellen Fulton, not only for her speech, but for everything she's done this year, uh, filling in and acting as a dean. She is absolutely remarkable, and the hours she puts in are amazing. So will you all please give her another round of applause? I now ask Professor Joy Kenwar to join me on the stage to assist with the awarding of the Master of Laws degrees to the class of 2019. Well, welcomed its eighth class of LLM students this past August. As lawyers trained abroad, they came to Brooklyn Law School to develop a deeper understanding of American law. But in addition to achieving that goal, they brought experience with them from legal systems from around the world, enriching our classrooms and our educational experiences as well. Mr. Sabotnik, 20 candidates have successfully pursued the program leading to the degree of Master of Laws. The faculty has found that they meet the standards of excellence and have demonstrated the personal qualities that make them worthy holders of a Brooklyn Law School degree. Will these candidates please rise? By the virtue of the authority vested in me, I confer upon each of you the degree of Masters of Laws with all the rights and privileges pertaining thereto. Would you please come to the stage? Mary Kummel Helmi Gurgis. <laughs> Augustus Karshan Balasubramaniam. <laughs> Sukanya Basak. Najeli Kiabet Shapiro. Thank you. 
Christopher Fodringham Garraway. Pranvera Jafai. Abdul Aziz Ibrahim Abu Nama. Mahmoud Ali Elashri. <laughs> Jonathan Fuchs. <laughs> Kinga Kurzina. <laughs> Muhammad Azim Ahmad. Hannah Hubana. Aileen Lorena Cabrera de Landestoy. Ajaliki Nicolaitis. Freddy Alberto Perez Duran. Angelica Maria Paupo. We will now proceed with the awarding of Juris Doctor degrees to the class of 2019. <clears throat> I want to point out that in your commencement program, there are listed a number of awards for membership on one of our school's journals, the Moot Court Honor Society, the Alternative Dispute Resolution Honor Society, and for the students who completed fellowships and volunteered their services, service to the law school through various activities. Later this month, we will announce the Latin honors on our website as well as by email. The faculty also will be selecting the recipients of our graduation awards and prizes, and the complete list of awardees, along with the prize and award descriptions, will be posted on our website and the recipients will be notified individually. We are very proud that these honorees of, and congratulate them on their significant achievements. Before I begin to read the names of our graduates, I want to mention that some of our graduates will be receiving diplomas from a relative who graduated from Brooklyn Law School or an employee of Brooklyn Law School who is a relative who is seated on the stage. This is a favorite graduation tradition of ours. Mr. Sabotnik, 328 candidates have successfully pursued the long and arduous program leading to the degree of Juris Doctor. The faculty has found that they meet the standards of excellence and have demonstrated the personal qualities that make them worthy holders of the Brooklyn Law School degree. Will these candidates pl please <clears throat> rise? By virtue of the authority vested in me, I confer upon each of you the degree of Juris Doctor with all the rights and privileges pertaining thereto. And now, under the direction of the marshals, I ask the candidates to please come to the stage row by row. Jack Berry. <laughs> Niall John Cook. <laughs> Charles G. Goulding. Nicholas S. Chimberas, Frank N. Kelly, 
Kelsey Loreen Kelly. Selena Magdalena Gonzalez. Kathleen L. Justice. Peyton R. Fisher. Matthew Creedon, whose diploma will be given by his brother, Mark Creedon, class of 2018. Sergey Risco. James M. Sheehan. Dominic M. Giannato. Katrina N. Gomez. Jennifer M. Esposito. Rachel A. Bryant. Megan C. Barden. Junta. Gabriella Junta. James M. Fisher III. James Kildiff, whose diploma will be given by his father, James Kildiff, class of 1996. Hi. Solomon Wolofsky and his baby Zoe. His, di his diploma will be given by his wife, Leo Wolofsky, class of 2018. Karina J. Castro. Alina A. Islam Hashmi. Farhana Hassan Chowdhury. Catherine I. Higginbottom. Tony K. Kim. Caitlin Baranowski. Mary Claire Kelly. Krista A. Gay. Sarah R. Cantos. Tyler Dorf, whose diploma will be given by his aunt, Roberta Asher, class of 1982. John Ehrman, whose diploma will be given by his father, John Ehrman, class of 1989. Samuel A. Goodstein. Menachem M. Fox. Nora Cropper Hood. Emily Carlson. Naomi Rachel Edwards. Jacqueline. Hellreich, uh, whose diploma will be given by her father, Stephen Hellreich, standing in for uh, her grandfather, Alvin Hellreich, class of 1954. Andrew Andrzejewski. Bailey M. Brown. <laughs> Bailey G. Gilbert. <laughs> Lauren, 
Lindita Caprick. Carmen Lamb. Isabella Lynn De Jesus. Muhammad Abdullah Fahim. Spencer Elliot Smith. Arbor Kobaj, whose diploma will be given by his mother, Marima Kobaj, class of 1998. Matthew A. Corigliano, with his daughters, Amelia and Scarlett. Natalie K. Marfo. Dominique Miller. Montanay Spate. Sarah Zipora Klugman. Matthew B. Zarzana. Jordan M. Steele. Brandon Lynn. Brittany Pagnota. Kelsey N. Lang. Christian Annalise Williams. Rebecca Tesfai. Devin Quinn. Ann Melton. John William Riley. Carolyn A. Morway. John J. Caruso and his son Israel. Benjamin Cohen. Gregory W. Bitar. Michael R. Kumar. Dylan Fohi. Fohi. Dylan Fohi, whose diploma will be given by his cousin, Jamie Fitzgerald, class of 2017. Brandon Joseph Fernandes. Alexander A. Cambanis. Esther B. Foyer. Rachel N. Friedman. Caitlin M. Kenny. Lauren Toms. Nikolai Albert Wolf. Joseph M. Young. Inga Smoliar. 
Caitlin E. Ryan. Catherine S. Menjivar. Christopher C. Malwitz. Maria A. Padova. Jordana Schacht Levine. Kendall Ickes. Camilo M. Burr. Michael Scott Greenberg. Nicole S. Haluyan. Danielle K. Forney. Kristen Beth Kennedy. Jenna Jones. Galliotti. Matthew Galliotti. Aaron C. Callahan. Grace Shamoon. Allison M. Kaneen. Taylor D. Smosky. Juliana D. Malandro. Brianna N. Stapleton. Troy Michael Stackpole. Ryan Zim. Michael J. Steffen. I will now turn the microphone over to our professor of law, Miriam Baer. Okay. Can I check for you? Okay. All right. Richard Ripley. <laughs> Thomas C. White. <laughs> Solomon Lim. <laughs> Carly Fulham. Christina Chapligina. David L. Ganaev. David L. Ganaev. Victor Siquiera Barbosa. Kevin Michael Dunshee. David Cass. Ahmed Kasikis. Okay. All right. All right. And now we have Charles Ainbinder, who will be given um, his uh, diploma by his grandfather, uh, Marvin Kornberg, class of 1958. Christine Hinsey. Lily J. Crone. Kyla Thornton. Christina M. Lo Judas. Jennifer Graw, who will be given her diploma by her mother, Teresa Graw, class of 1989. 
Jinyi Pak. Cara Marie Pope. Okay. Stephanie R. Yaffe. Okay. Pratusha Srikakulam. Tori S. Levine. Emily B. Rupert. Kristen K. Tessie. Nicole Z. Zavidoff. Okay, Benjamin Finkelstein, who will receive his diploma from both his father. Um, and grandfather, Robert Finkelstein, class of 1988, and Daniel Finkelstein, class of 1955. Okay. Okay. William T. Kennefake. Justin M. Friel. Asha Marie Jaramogi. Christine L. Barrett. Okay. Jennifer Taormina and her son, Nico. Lauren A. Pagan. Kaur. Kaur, right? Demand Deep Core. Okay. Tyler Groskinski. Yeah. Nicholas J. Denny. Clayton James Cosby. Andrea, Andrea. Andrea N. Smithson. Zachary T. Meyer. Jeffrey J. Mitchell. Reza Mohammadzadeh. Eileen C. Breslin. Woo! Eleanor M. Shaton. <laughs> Tina Lynn. <laughs> Louis A. Lopez. <laughs> Robert Maximilian Levy. Brett R. Feldman. Okay, Brendan Brown, who will be given his diploma by his brother, Brian Brown, class of 2016. Joshua A. Filzer. Hayden W. Ginsburg. <laughs> Chloe Madeline Gordils. <laughs> Shelby Nicole Anderson. <laughs> Jason Henry George. Okay, that was easy. <laughs> Robert J. Candela. Anthony DiLorenzo. Oh, great. Okay. 
Joshua Kaufman, who will be given his diploma by his mother and brother, Rita Kaufman, class of 1987, and Zach Kaufman, class of 2016. Rebecca Meyer. William Carreri. <laughs> Mary Claire Kennedy. <laughs> Ashley Debbie Messier. <laughs> Alec S. Nelson. <laughs> Brandon Fleischacker. <laughs> Sabrina M. Woods. Joshua C. Trachtenberg. Yota Okutani. Lance Lazaro, who will be receiving his diploma from his mother, Rebecca Lazaro, class of 1990. Edward Mandala. David Audell. Blaise A. Gibson. Okay. Javionte Johnson, who will be receiving his diploma from his partner, Crystal Peters, class of 2017. Lauren K. Blake. Okay. <laughs> Esther Wortman, who's here with her daughter, Ramona. Okay, Bijou Shire Altamirano, who's here with her son, Angel. Richard Anthony Carroll. Ilana Gibson. Ashley Augustin. Terry M. Frederick. Mia Cruz Worthy. Jenna E. Hastings. Isaro L. Carter. Brianna A. Semenza. Michael A. Neville. Haley K. Lonsberg. Corinne Marie LaBella. I think so. <laughs> William R. Ognebene. Paul E. Wagonseller. Lucy Jo Smith. I think I got it. Janessa M. Lever. Winnie O. Lee T. Williams. Aaron M. Sir. Christopher Leland Cummins, Jr. 
Jared M. Steiner. Megan K. Hines. Stephanie A. McPeak. Samantha F. Sigalakis Minsky. Maybelline Guido Vaccarano Duran. <laughs> Alia Sumro. <laughs> Craig Harrington. <laughs> Deborah So. George Joseph Somi. Mark Machu, who will receive his diploma from his fiance, Anna McGrain Mungo, class of 2017. Derek James Lynch. Marilyn Yuan. Edward B. Soto. Cheris Lamb. Bojun Jang. Michael T. Nyberg. Dylan Porcello. <laughs> Timothy F. McCann. <laughs> David Resnick. <laughs> Ann Achatella. <laughs> Catherine Sintron. Jenny W. Hugh. Alexander S. Mendelssohn. Okay. Christine Sisto, Sisto, who will receive her diploma from her uncle, the Honorable Paul DeFonzo, class of 1981. Jordan Mendelssohn, who will be receiving her diploma from Jeffrey Schwab, class of 1964. Rachel Klein Walker. Mia Elizabeth Cooper. My Win. Muhammad Usman Malik. Michael Angelo Morando. Alexa Gail Rubenstein. Sarah M. Rubin, and now I am happy to hand this over to Professor Michael Gerber. Kathleen Riley. <laughs> Caitlin Schwartz, who will receive her degree from her mother and father. Kathleen Gallagher, class of 1984, and Andrew Schwartz, also class of 1984. Andrea I. Shear. Olivia Sanchez.
Veronica Mishkin, who will receive her degree from her mother, Rhonda Laufer, class of 1988. Zhao Chen Dai. Amos C. Kim. Yixin Chi. Adam X. Dong. Nicholas Basil Hilaris. Haley Baba, who will receive her degree from her mother and uncle, Karen Abadante Baba, class of 1983, and Thomas Abadante, class of 1988. Sean J. Hahn. David Gantz Huberman, who will receive his degree from his brother, Robert, class of 2014. Jesenia I. Brewster. Peter R. Figman. Veda. Veda. Raymond J. Veda. Thomas Landman. Alex B. Pia. William Henry Riggin. Richard A. Zaberto. Joseph D. Thomas. Melissa A. Persaud. Manraj Sekhan. <laughs> Natasha J. Matias. <laughs> Christina Todorovic. Andre Alexander Dwayne Nelson. Okay. Thank you. Andre Alexandro Dwayne Nelson. <laughs> Mario Q. Fitzgerald. Mayrani Heredia. Mayrani Heredia. I know that. Janae Cummings, and to assist in presenting her degree as her father and a 15 year member of the Brooklyn Law School Library staff, Jerome Cummings. Elizabeth, Elizabeth V. Ildefonso. Anna W. Chan. Emma R. Ellis, who will receive her degree from her spouse, Andrew Sipos, class of 2014. John H. Jaskowski. Amanda R. Fell. John S. Crane.
Catherine R. Screen. Sabina Yevdayeva. Manisha Verma. Michael Tal. Yakira Lally. I'm sorry. Vimla. Vimla Worsley. Michael F. Luongo. Amber A. Leary. Martin Rowe, whose father, Martin Rowe, class of 1989, will award him his degree. Benjamin Stadler. Brenda Joy Solovsky. Ernesto Alexander Slater. <laughs> Ali Fadil. Max Alan Max Alan Azuri. Charles Peabody Cheney. Matthew C. Grossbard. Brett Abrams. Anne Carey, who will receive her degree from her mother, Lisa Carey, class of 1981. Caitlin G. Bond. Stephanie Marie Cochlin. Victoria L. Yaus. Mm -hmm. Susan F. Swibel. John Paul Stefan. Michael A. Sheffman. Francis. Alexander R. Meza. Dimitri Gizis. Joshua A. Siegel. Jesse R. Mountner. <laughs> Lucas Edgar Wary. <laughs> Zachary J. Small. Cameron Lowe, who will receive his degree from his mother, Wanda Denson Lowe, class of 1981. Michelle R. Rosenblum. <laughs> Valerie Cesarenko. Camila Patrapelic. <laughs> Anna Maria Turkovic. Hannah R. Pickens. Brittany B. Brock. Jacob A. Zucker. Jamie Mollis. Anne Marie. 
I'm sorry. Carrie Ann McDonough. Rachel M. Mohabir. And? And Lior. Victoria Moisa and Sasha. Sasha. Lior and Sasha. Giancarlo Vecchiarelli. <laughs> Chin Lai Richard Sui. <laughs> Kaishi Echo Wong. Yatang Zheng. Sarah A. Lepus. Han Zhang. Aubria Ralph. Tony Ann Teratola. Joshua Troper, who will receive his degree from his grandfather, the Honorable Edward Bennett, class of 1957. Jason R. Zakovic. <laughs> Melanie, <coughs> Melanie N. Elner. <laughs> Fatih Kangos. <laughs> Sophia Ahmed. <laughs> Brian B. De Stefano, yeah. Jerome D. Grazioli. Are you the last? I think so. Right? Natasha. Natasha. Natasha Sherbatsevich. I am delighted to present the class of 2019. Dean Marilyn Fulton will now close the 117th Brooklyn Law School commencement ceremony, more to come, after which I ask the faculty members and our guests on the stage to leave the hall first by departing from the stage through the hall, and the students will follow the faculty members. I ask all the guests to please remain in your seats until the recession the recessional is completed. Thank you. Okay. I get to close this ceremony. All right. All right. Graduates, alumni, you have worked hard to arrive at this day. Everyone who has supported and cheered you on along the way, your families, your friends, your teachers, your alumni mentors, your dean, and the entire Brooklyn Law School community take great pride in your achievement. 
We are all excited to see how you're going to change the world in the years ahead. Now that I have you, I want to say two final things. One, I look forward to seeing you and your guests at the picnic at the law school following the ceremony. Two, enjoy every moment of the day. Congratulations.